Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today on the on our GASI webinar session. As you know, the GASI webinar series serves as a platform for the GASI network members to share experience and expertise in evidence synthesis and to learn about potential collaborations. So before we get, we begin with today's session, um, we're going to go through some technicalities. Uh, automatically, everyone is muted until one of the organizers unmutes you. So if you would like to ask any question, you have the option to use the raise your hand uh, option where we can see that you have your hand uh, raised and we will unmute you when it's time for questions. Or you can also submit your questions on the uh, right, on the tab, uh, through the question pane. So today's session is about policy relevant evidence maps, a method to inform decision making in the public sector. And we will have Karine Van Ziel with us today. Karine holds a master's degree in political sciences and, and honors in political science, as well as a BA degree in journalism, all from the University of Pretoria. She's an assistant research specialist in the research unit at the Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation, DPME, the South African government. Since she started at DPME in October 2016, she has been involved in focused research work related to evidence-based policy decision-making, which includes systematic reviews and the development of evidence maps to inform important policy decisions in the, in the department and government. We also have with us Lawrence Langer. Lawrence holds a PhD from the University College London and a BA degree in Development Studies from the University of Johannesburg. Lawrence is an evidence synthesis specialist at the University of Johannesburg Africa Center for Evidence. Lawrence leads ACE's work in supporting national government decision makers in South Africa to integrate evidence from research syntheses, such as evidence maps, systematic views or meta-analyses, in the formulation and design of public policies and programs. She has, he has, I'm sorry, he has supported the South African Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation for two years in their production of three evidence synthesis to inform national policy. Lawrence and Karine, we are very excited to hear from you. Brilliant. Thank you so much for this, uh, Tamara, um, for the introduction. I'm just getting the technology sorted here. I hope you can see my screen um, yes, it's properly great. now. Um, yes, so uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Um, I'm, I'm Lawrence from the Africa Center for Evidence, and I'm sitting here in Johannesburg uh, with Karen from DPME, and we're very excited to talk with you today a bit more about uh, policy relevant evidence maps, which we think might be quite an exciting method uh, to inform decision making in the public sector. So I think we have uh, 40 minutes to give you our input and I'm looking forward to the Q&A for, for 20 minutes afterwards. So to just give you a bit of an overview how we will, how we will um, structure um, our, our 40 minutes of the um, presentation. So I will start us off now with a very short high level um, background introduction to evidence mapping and then hand over to Karen who will give you the, the heart of the presentation who will show you the exciting evidence maps that DPME has uh, produced. Uh, and the functionality of the evidence map as well as how it's been used um, for policy decision making. And after that, I will then um, wrap up the session for 10 minutes to give you a bit of reflection from a methodological um, point of view, from a systematic viewpoint of view, and what the adaptations were uh, in the process of developing the evidence map in particular in relation to uh, policy relevance. Um, just before we can get started, it would be really lovely for us to just have a quick indication of how many of you have heard about evidence maps before or have done one before, so we kind of can see um, the familiarity with the methodology. Okay, so we see that actually um, a minority of you have not done an evidence map before. Um, so I think, I'll, as I will elaborate a bit more just now, that's not necessarily too surprising. I think it's fair to say that evidence mapping is a new methodology in that regard. Um, and I will give you now, for those people in particular, a bit of a high-level introduction to what evidence maps are and how they fit in relation to systematic reviews. So evidence maps really is a bit of a new kit on the block when it comes to systematic review and evidence synthesis uh, methodology. The, the 
there's quite a few organizations who are currently doing them, uh, ranging from the International Initiative for Impact Evaluation to CAMPER, to the Inter International Rescue Committee, DFID, DPME, and many others. And uh, because of this plethora of organizations doing them, we also really, the evidence map we see tech a lot of different forms. So there can be a heat map an approach, as you see here. It can be an intervention to outcome mapping of the evidence using bubbles to visualize the size of the evidence as clearly here. It can be in an Excel spreadsheet as here uh, in different example, um, or it can be on the software that DPME is using, which is merging some of these. So there's really um, quite a few of different approaches out there. There's a diversity of um, approaches to visualize evidence maps and yeah, quite a few of methodological innovation going on. And that also relates into, I think, a large number of people um, uh, engage with evidence maps. So for example, as a recent global evidence synthesis and, and other evidence synthesis events, there were panels on evidence mapping, a small breakout session. So there's quite a, quite a conversation going on around evidence mapping, which then also relates on people um, writing about evidence mapping and for more academic audience, so two really good introductory paper, for example, our Bertie Snilsvit and Isumi Mikali, um, which I think if you're interested in a more academic background, give a really good introduction to evidence mapping. An um, interesting point here for us in particular is that evidence maps really do feature across sectors, uh, so systematic reviews sometimes dominate a bit in healthcare on the health policy making sector, but we do see evidence map popping up in a lot of different sectors from international development to education, social care, etc. But to just be very clear from the onset for current and I, how we position ourselves, um, we are concerned with evidence mapping in one particular setting, and that is the public um, sector decision making. Um, so we're not necessarily approaching this from a uh, from a research on ac academia perspective, as, but from a public sector perspective. Um, and But also just as an acknowledgement, I think the uh, methodology we are talking about has most been informed by, by, by 3IE's approach to evidence uh, gap maps. So now in the next five minutes, I really just want to position evidence mapping quickly uh, in the wider evidence synthesis field. So we see evidence mapping as part of the family of evidence synthesis. Um, so they belong into the same research methods as systematic reviews, rapid evidence assessments, um, et cetera. And just so when we think about evidence, in synthesis, it's really for us about getting to graphs with, with a body of knowledge or using the analogy here, um, um, uh, a crop of knowledge. So you can see uh, in the picture in front of you, kind of we, we see the different crops, which are our primary studies. Um, but for evidence synthesis, we assume that these primary studies need to be collected and harvested and structured in a, in a transparent manner um, so that we can then look into what do we learn from the field of knowledge or the body of knowledge. So evidence synthesis to us really is about the transparent and structured um, collection, appraisal and synthesis of a body of, of knowledge. And um, we see evidence mapping fitting into this spectrum of uh, different ways or different methodologies to collect and organize a, a body of evidence or body of knowledge. So if we start from literature reviews all the way to systematic reviews as the gold standard of evidence synthesis, we, we think evidence maps fit in that uh, spectrum. Uh, of, of methodologies in that regard. So there are a method to collect and make sense of a body of knowledge. Um, so within evidence maps themselves, as with evidence synthesis methodologies in, in general, um, there's quite a diversity and there can, evidence maps can take many different forms and, and many different purposes. I think the most common approach from evidence map is really to give you what you see in front of you. You, uh, an overview of the field of knowledge or a bird's eye view of the field of knowledge. So it's a, a high structured, um, a high level overview of, of a body of research to understand the structures, to understand the silos of research or the, the deserts of research or the lack of research. So to really understand macro pattern and macro structures within the evidence, within the body of evidence to get a quick and, and easy accessible overview of this evidence. However, having said that, in particular, evidence maps that um, focus on um, uh, that have more advanced IT capabilities, so they often allow you to integrate particular aspects of the body of evidence. So to zoom in some areas of saturation where there's lots of research and to unpack on a more granular level in a descriptive way, what is uh, the, the research telling us here. Um, however, just as a big acknowledgement upfront, evidence maps are not normative in a sense as a systematic review. So they do not necessarily answer question of what works or what doesn't work or how does it work. Um, they are more about a descriptive overview of the body of, 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 of knowledge or the body of evidence. So say as on an evidence map you can see yourself, you can find yourself. So you as we've indicated here with orange circles. So you can 
position yourself and you can understand the overview. However, if you're looking for a prepackaged answer, which you see in the picture on the right as a tractor, um, that's not necessarily what ev evidence maps do. Um, they kind of do something more like in the next picture here. They, they pre-appraise and pre-organize the body of evidence for you. But the actual engagement of picking up the different crops and doing the synthesis, that is a step that evidence maps usually do not engage in. Um, which then begs a big question, uh, well, mapping the evidence, why would you want to do that? In particular, in the public sector uh, perspective. So if I've just said evidence maps not necessarily or not usually answer a question of what works, um, why would a policymaker be interested? I think the, the answer really to us is that evidence maps do allow you to integrate and advocate for the use of bodies of evidence within the decision-making context. And often we find systematic reviews are not the, the, the most effective tool in, in certain policy contexts. So for example, if we have a very hotly debated and hotly contested policy environment, um, a systematic review that makes very strong answers as to what you should do or shouldn't do might not necessarily be the most ban and input in such a policy debate. So we then think that evidence maps might be a bit more um, a bit more diplomatic approach to still advocate for a body of evidence to enter a policy debate. And quite often they are helpful. We've just outlined here a few approaches of how they could fit in, um, which I'm not going to go into too much detail. But for example, if you map an evidence against your policy intervention and you find there's very little evidence, without having to do a systematic review, you might already want to consider if the intervention you've identified is the most relevant one. Or the other scenario where you map again evidence against policy interventions, if you find there's lots of good evidence um, on a particular intervention which you currently have not considered in a policy context, you then might want to reconsider that um, introducing that intervention. And there's other scenarios that I won't go into detail now. Um, but so just to, I think, sum up my, my quick introduction here, why we think um, uh, evidence maps might be used in a decision-making context is, is because they do support the consideration of bodies of evidence. And I think this is really the, the, the point um, in terms of advocacy, how we would put, um, position bodies, um, evidence maps in relation to bodies of evidence. And so I will now hand over to Karen, who will tell you much more about the practicalities of how they've piloted a program of work around uh, using evidence maps to get to graphs with a body of evidence. Hello everybody and thank you Lawrence for that. Um, for setting the pace so high, I'm going to try to not disappoint you. Um, so my job today is to just demonstrate to you the functionality of the evidence mapping tool that we have developed in the Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation, and that is DBME. I will give a brief introduction followed by background information on how we came about in developing our first evidence map on human settlement. And thereafter, I will show you what our evidence map tool looks like on the front end as well as the back end, or as we call it, the EM Capture platform. And then to close off, I'll just say a few words on how we're using evidence maps in the department as well as the plans we have moving forward. Um, so just as an introduction, there's always been a bit of a challenge around ch um, policies, as I'm sure you know, around the development and then the implementation um, and then the science behind it. As we know, evidence is required, but where does government fit in within this evidence space? There is an increased need for policy relevant research, but where do we find it? Who is producing it and how is it being used? Now, with in the knowledge economy, there are three systems, that of science and innovation, that of indigenous or local knowledge systems, and then the system of policy and decision making, and that's where we are. So yeah, just to give you a bit of an overview on the context that we're working in. Um, Within the DPME currently and in the presidency since 2003, via the program to support pro poor policy development, that's PSPPD, evidence based policy making has been championed as a methodology to bring evidence into the policy making space. Now, this is an integrated model that you can see here of the policy cycle with the types of evidence needed at each section of the cycle. Um, the guys at the department use this model to train senior government officials and policy makers on evidence-based policy making. But as we know, there is a tendency to, to go straight from agenda setting to planning without understanding root cause problems and without looking at a range of evidence through synthesis, method, synthesis methods or investigated what the very, investigating what the various options are before planning. And as we all know, this can have negative consequences. Right, so to give you a background on the evidence mapping in DPME, 
Our journey on the evidence mapping path started during a policy moment in 2015-16, when the reviewing of the white paper on human settlements was on, on the table. So by following a co-production model where the department's research unit and sector specialists work closely with experts from outside, an evidence map was developed for human settlements. Um, I'll talk a little bit later about the National Development Plan, but human settlements is contained in Chapter 8 of our NDP. So a framework was developed, which you'll also see later, that consisted out of interventions and outcomes, and this formed the skeleton or the matrix of the map. As with all of our projects, it was linked to government's five-year strategic framework and the National Development Plan. That's the NDP. Okay. Ultimately, we produced a tool that consists out of a front end or the the visual side of things, that's the evidence map, and a back end where data capturing takes place. And this also allows continued on in this journey with evidence mapping in other fields such as education, build, um, the top a study around building the, a capable and developmental state in South Africa, and then the national spatial development framework, etc. And I'll give a little bit more detail on this in my last slide. So without further delay, I want to go into the exciting, interesting part, and I'm going to show you some slides to give you an idea of what this map or tool looks like. So this is just a snapshot of the map and what it looks like on the front end. You are able to scroll up and down and left and right. And just to, to also give a heads up or for your information, currently the, this map can only be accessed from our internal server at the department um, while we're still working on user access restrictions, etc. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what this map can do and how we use it. Just for maximum view, I've minimized the part on filtering, but I'm going to get back to it now, just to give you a clearer view of what the, the map looks like. Unfortunately, I can't give you a full view, so, you know, but you'll, you're able to scroll up and down and left and right. Okay, so you'll see that in the map there are bubbles. Um, cells, rows, and columns. On the left-hand side, or on the y-axis, going down, there's a list of interventions. Okay, so this is the human settlements map, all right? Um, these inter interventions are divided into those related to housing and then those related to human settlements, with state and non-state interventions in each, and then in those interventions divided into financial and non-financial, which in turn have been divided further into sub-interventions. And then at the top row, or the x-axis, whichever way you want to call it, there are listed outcomes and sub-outcomes. This structure underwent a lot of detailed discussions by um, the research team and the sector specialists. And the actual content of the map, or where the evidence lies, is shown in the bubbles. Now, just to give you a little bit of information to remember later on, I'm going to come back to it. When you look at the, um, the, the outcomes, main outcomes have identifiers, okay? Now, I'm going to refer to this when I show you the capture end. They have unique identifiers. Very unique identifiers would be the parent identifiers of the sub-outcome under it and so on and so forth. Okay, I'm going to get back to it. It's going to make sense, promise. <laughs> okay, so when it comes to bubbles, columns and rows, when it comes to looking at evidence contained in this map, the bubbles give you an indication of where the majority of the evidence pieces are located and where there are currently gaps. This map enables you to look at the contents of the bubble as well as to get aggregated lists of evidence contained in columns as well as rows. Um, and then the big bubble on the top left hand side contains a list of all the evidence pieces contained in the map. When you click on this bubble, you will see that this particular map contains 400, 409 pieces of evidence. Um, same way you can click on a row or a column for an aggregated list, but I'm going to show you what, it, what this list looks like now. So for example, you've clicked on one of the single bubbles there. Inside the map, a list will appear where the evidence pieces. And just to say that where you cannot see bubbles, there actually is evidence in there. The bubbles are just too small. So it, it means that there's not many pieces of evidence in there. But when a cell is gray, it means that there's nothing in there. All right. So once you've clicked on a bubble, this is what you'll see you will get a list of evidence pieces that are contained in that particular bubble. 
So here you can also scroll up and down to have a look at all the titles, or you can click on the export to Excel icon at the top right hand corner in order to get this list in a Microsoft Excel format. Okay. Um, yeah, you can then analyze, sort it, filter it, work with it, or print it, whatever you want to do with it. Um, and then at the top of the list, on the left-hand side, you'll see a total there, which means in this particular case, this little bubble that we clicked on has 38 individual pieces of evidence contained in it. Okay. Then when you move to the right, right next to the export to Excel um, icon, you'll see a little breakdown and it's color coded. Gray means gray literature, which means this, um, this bubble contains 35 pieces of evidence from gray literature. And then three formal literature searches of which um, two, when we did a critical appraisal, two have been deemed strong and one is a little, well, you have to be a little bit careful, it's not that strong. So that's what that means. Green means strong, red means weak, and then gray means gray literature. If you would like to have, now say for example, you scroll down this list and one of the um, titles kind of tickles your fancy and you would like to have more information on this one, then you just merely click on the blue title of, the, of that evidence piece. And then what happens next is you'll find a one page summary on that piece of evidence. This basically just gives you an idea of what the paper is about and which outcomes and interventions it is relevant to. So once you've read through this one page summary and you want more information or you would like to see the full text, you merely go to the hyperlink title there, you click on it and voila, there's your full text. All right. But just to flag, Keep in mind that full texts, especially in the formal searches, are not all open access, which is why we cannot make this evidence map more public for use until we have finalized our access and user restrictions. All right, another thing that's very, very important for us in our context is that we want our maps to stay relevant and updated. Okay, so we have a little bit of a functionality there at the top right hand corner where you can click on three little dots if you want to submit comments or new pieces of evidence. So say for example, you have decided, well, you went through the evidence pieces in this map and you know about it, something new that came out, you can contact us, you can click on this there, comments and submissions, and then it'll take you to this little dialog box. You just fill in the details there, you select the document, and then you can submit it to us. Now, Lawrence is going to show, show you a little bit more about the methodological process. Um, but each piece of the evidence goes through a process of screening to find out whether or not it can be included or not um, based on relevance. So this piece of evidence will not necessarily just automatically be added to the evidence map. It will undergo the same process. Okay. And then just... This one last thing on this front end, um, it also enables us to filter. So you can filter using keywords and apply, or you can just select your filters with a click, um, which is built in on the back end the way we want it. Okay. Now, when it comes to capturing on the back end, um, we get guided in terms of what we capture. And in this case, we used a PICO summary. For those of you who do not know, PICO stands for Population, Intervention, Comparator, and Outcome. And this just basically guides the whole data capturing process. Now, from here on, I'm just going to give you a quick glimpse of what our evidence map capture platform looks like at the back end. And this is where the magic happens, as I like to call it. But many people might not <laughs> agree with me by the looks of this. Okay, so this is what it currently looks like. Each and every piece of evidence in the map gets an automatically generated unique identifier. So when one element gets linked with another, we use parent identifiers. Remember what I told you earlier? For example, an outcome will have a unique identifier, which will also be the parent identifier of a sub outcome under that one. Now there at the top on the right hand side is what we call a little transaction table. 
This is where the evidence pieces get placed in different cells per interventions and outcomes. This is done with the identifiers or the unique identifiers of each of the relevant outcomes and interventions in, in each case. Now, as you can see, this looks really busy, complex, and maybe a little bit messy, especially for someone who has to do the data capturing. All right. And that is exactly why our IT guys are currently working really hard, to, hard towards making this a little bit cleaner and more user friendly, like this. Okay. So this is our new look, and it's still in progress, but we're very excited about it because it enables us to search, it enables us to do a whole lot of other things. Things. There's no more ID unique identifiers to keep track of, and it's just lovely. All right. So when it comes to the actual use of this evidence map, we consider the need for evidence synthesis within the policy space. There firstly is the danger of a single study that we need to avoid. Um, merely looking at one single study would not be sufficient when it comes to making policy decisions on an area that affects the live, lives of an entire population. New knowledge and patterns actually rest in an area in the totality of evidence. So we need multiple evidence pieces. Okay. Thirdly, we need evidence synthesis to address complexity. We need to understand contexts and have access to relevant information in order to inform policy making that should support positive social outcomes. And then fourthly, we need it in order to be pragmatic. Policymakers, as you can imagine, do not have the time to access, appraise, and read all evidence on a certain topic. So this evidence mapping exercise assists greatly where this is concerned, as it vis visualizes um, where the evidence lies and gives a picture of what is out there. Zooming into our little research unit at the department, we play a supporting role to the rest of the department. In other words, policy decision makers okay and just like that the rest of uh, and just like the deep the rest of dpme like i said earlier we get our mandate from the national development plan or ndp that is also linked to the government's five-year strategic framework everything we do must be relevant and useful so we respond to policy needs that are linked to what is contained in the chapters of the of the ndp and then within this context the use of evidence maps is linked to policy analysis and then translating these into strategies. So evidence maps in our case, visualize and organize evidence that are based on policy priorities. In addition to this, evidence maps provide a sound evidence base from which to draw and which to use when we get requests from decision makers. And this is a function that I love in particular. Linking to the previous point, we started exploring the possibility of starting to perform a function of rapid response, um, where we respond to information needs of policy decision makers as quickly as possible. Sometimes we even have a day or two to respond, as these requests can at times be really really, really urgent. And what is great about the rigorous and transparent systematic process of developing these maps is that it gives us complete confidence in what is contained in these evidence bases. And we can motivate why certain evidence pieces were included and why others were excluded. We can also use and present information contained in there with confidence which is a really, really big, big benefit for us. The fact that we always, um, then another point is that the fact that we always try to follow a co-production model, this um, builds capacity. As we learn from experts outside of government, like Ace and Lawrence and the team, um, and hopefully they also learn some from us. <laughs> and then when looking at policy relevant evidence maps such as ours, one is also able to define research agendas and needs for further evidence synthesis. And we also get to see where the gaps are and where further research needs to be done. Like Lauren said earlier, we do realize that evidence maps do not necessarily give us straightforward answers to all of our challenges, but they do give solid evidence and guidance where it is needed. All right, so just to give you a bit of a glimpse of what we're currently busy with, keeping ourselves busy with in the research unit in DPME and what our plans are and where we're going from here forward. 
What we're currently busy with is updating the human settlements map in order to make sure that it stays relevant. I'm also going to just mention to you what chapters it's linked to in the National Development Plan. This one is linked to Chapter 8 of the NDP. Then furthermore, we followed this same evidence mapping approach that Lawrence will, will elaborate on further, methodologically speaking, um, in finding evidence to inform decisions around building a capable and developmental state in South Africa as per chapter 13 of the NDP. This evidence base has so far proven very useful in response to questions and producing policy relevant reports. Now we're in the process of working towards capturing the data and visually presenting it in our evidence mapping tool. But you can see how useful this has been for us so far in quickly and effectively responding to questions from policy decision makers. And we, can't, we could do that confidently because we knew that the evidence was sound. We are also currently developing an evidence map for the early grade mathematics study in education together with the Department of Basic Education. And this one is linked to chapter nine of the NDP. At the same time, we're also working towards developing an evidence map for the National Spatial Development Framework, of which the details are contained in chapter eight of the NDP. And lastly, we are, as I mentioned earlier, busy making that busy EM capture platform more user friendly. Finally, I would just like to say from my side that we're really committed to contributing towards sound evidence-informed policy decision-making in the public sector. And being able to work in this environment excites us and we find it extremely valuable. And just to wrap it up, in a nutshell, at the department, in our research unit, we love evidence. So now I'm going to give over to, to Lawrence to take you through the methodological adaptation front yeah we practiced that and um i'm going to give over to Lawrence now. thank you very much it's great thank you brilliant um thank you so much karen i think karen has done um an amazing job in showing you how dpme's um beautiful evidence map uh, do look like and the functionalities um behind the like the evidence mapping tool. Uh, so I really just want to wrap up now in 10 minutes um, from a research synthesis or systematic view perspective, um, just highlighting some of the major adaptations that uh, took place. So in particular for, for our methods audience. Um, so yeah, so that will be the next 10 minutes with me. So I think before I really start going um, in a bit more detail on the methods, so the, the seven steps behind DPME's evidence maps, you can see now at the moment in front of you. Um, I think just important what's the flag up front is that uh, DPME's policy relevant evidence maps do go through a rigorous and transparent research process, as you would expect from any evidence synthesis of a systematic view or create these evidence gap maps. So the principles of systematic reviewing um, are not compromised um, to an extent where we would not put it as a research method forward. Um, however, working in a policy context, there was a need for us to work together and to open up each and every step of traditional systematic review and to integrate are they relevant um, to our context, to decision-making needs, and what are the pros and cons of, of traditional systematic reviewing approaches. And in, in that working together, I think we really try to balance uh, three aspects. That was first the technical rigor of the research process, but as much as the relevance to decision-makers, as well as whether or not the final product, the evidence map, would be legitimate within the decision-making context. And this particular way of working together to adapt and um, iterate on, on research steps for decision-making context, that really only was possible through the co-production model that uh, Karen has alluded to. And I have a final slide on that. It's slightly beyond the scope of this particular presentation, but the, the way we worked together and why it did allow us to do these adaptations and we don't think it would have been possible um, without that particular co-production approach. And it's just also to flag up front, the end goal of this exercise was not to publish a, a, a research report or an academic paper, it was develop a tool that does allow DPME to integrate and engage with a body of evidence. So that's why there's not necessarily the publication on it yet, it's probably forthcoming, um, but it's not a static research output, it's a vibrant and up-to-date a decision-making tool. So yeah, having said that up front, so there are seven steps behind the DPME evidence maps. Um, um, most of some of them will look quite familiar to a systematic review audience. Um, and I will, after 
was is step, just highlight five key adaptations um, that we think uh, was the most crucial one. So step one is the developing a policy narrative, which you would see is not necessarily what you do in a systematic review. And I'll comment on that a bit more uh, in the next slide. And, but having the policy narrative is kind of the essential outline of how the evidence map can be used in a decision-making context. Um, it's a diagnostic of where's the space for an evidence map within current policy the debates and having identified that space how do you get a product like an evidence map into this space and it's kind of the step is completely driven by the decision makers themselves and it then informs all future research steps associated with the evidence map so it does provide the guideline or the framework for, for the um, further research steps which then are a bit more traditionally what you would expect from a systematic review so step two is to decide what is constituting policy relevant evidence, which is closer to defining inclusion criteria. So the effort emphasis here really is on policy relevant evidence um, in terms of setting the criteria. But then we go into a systematic and scientific search for evidence, both of the gray and of the academic literature. Having screened identified these, we go into the typical data extraction and then from there move move into the um, uh, critical appraisal stage, which not necessarily all evidence maps do, um, but we have so far done it within the evidence maps for DPME. And the point here really is about appraising for both the methodological trustworthiness of the primary evidence as well as the relevance to decision-making context. Uh, and then having done that, kind of having in a systematic and transparent manner, get to grab with the evidence base, we then move into the presentation and visual visualization of the evidence base itself, which Karen has shown you uh, quite a few um, slides on how it looks like for DPMEs, uh, for software in particular. Step seven is then coming back to the policy narrative and um, uh, picking up on the outline policy narrative to engage the evidence map within decision-making context to ensure it's being used. So this is kind of the rough overall um, seven broad steps. They all have a lot of um, different subcomponents, certainly, um, but it's kind of the overall flow of the of the decision-making, uh, of the research and decision-making methodology that we've been working on. I will just wanted to highlight five key adaptation very quickly um, from a systematic view um, point of view. And the first one really is this uh, policy narrative and how it relates to framework development. So as I said, the policy narrative is about identifying the space where this evidence map could be going. And it's done by the decision makers themselves. It's discussions between government colleagues as to where in the current policy debate is there a space or is there a need for something like an evidence map. And if there's a space, how do we get the evidence map there? Who is a custodian of the evidence map in the public sector? Who might oppose it? Who might advocate for it? What would the input change within the policy debates? And what does that mean for how we design the evidence map? So this is really what we understand by a policy narrative. Um, and it's not really stakeholder engagement. It's something um, that's much closer within government and it's about outlining a diagnostic of how the product can be used and how it can be embedded into existing policy decision making processes so that it has legitimacy within the policy um, debates. Um, so there's quite a few um, work associated with that but I think from a methods point of view just what's really striking is how does that then relate to framework development. So from the evidence maps that I've shown at the beginning um, they usually map evidence against two variables quite often intervention to outcome um, variables. Within the evidence maps that we've done so far this, this changes quite a bit. So the, the variables or the framework is determined by policy documentation. For example Africa's national development plan or the medium-term strategic framework or the policy cycles themselves that goes from diagnosis to design, planning, m and &E, and impact. Um, so there's quite a few of policy documentation that you can use to open up that framework and to just show um, in particular in the slide now what that meant for, for the first uh, evidence map on human settlements um, that roughly what was in an intervention to outcome thinking um, it meant quite quickly that the intervention Interventions um, were immediately defined by existing policy instruments and programs. So um, we use the existing white papers in the, in the policy space to identify what are the policy mechanisms and instruments that are being used or are being considered to be used. And this then defines the programs that were populated for the evidence maps. Likewise, for the outcomes, the outcomes became government's own priority. So South African um, decision-making processes are guided by something called the medium-term strategic framework, which does outline goals and indicators that public servants and departments work towards. So these written down and published um, and uh, agreed on government priorities uh, were then used um, for the outcome framework. 
and what that does in a way to the to the change of how you approach the, the the gaps and the saturation that you see on the evidence map is that you're not necessarily talking uh, so bubbles where there's a, a lack of, of bubbles or there's not a lot of research you're not necessarily talking about um, that's the absence of, of primary studies per se. But what you're talking about is that you have uh, on the matrix a policy priority as identified by the MTSF, as well as the policy instrument that's being considered, and there's no decision-making guidance at all on this particular configuration. So it is quite a, a bit stronger um, approach than just to say there's no research. But in this particular setup, you can say there's a decision-making gap. Moving on to key adaptation two, um, around designing inclusion criteria. Um, as Karen has alluded to, we actually did use the established PICO frameworks for systematic reviewing, but we needed to open them up to not just look at a structured and transparent manner in which to include like technical um, research documents, but also to design inclusion criteria for relevance and leg legitimacy, uh, which made it slightly more tricky to have clear and defined inclusion criteria. And one of the key adaptations in that regard, in particular how it relates to relevance, was to adopt a multi-tier approach to setting inclusion criteria. So when, we, when the decision makers came around the table to think about, well, what needs to be in this map for the map to be relevant, it became quite clear very quickly, for example, that we needed to be more inclusive for evidence from within South Africa than we had to with, uh, for evidence from international context. So there are two different set of inclusion criteria to ensure that the most relevant evidence, the evidence from South Africa and comparable context was prioritized. Likewise, just a point on legitimacy, it was quite clear that the inclusion criteria had to be designed in a way that the evidence that was already in the policy domain is being um, included within the evidence map. Because if there is a government report that has high currency, maybe even the minister talks about it. If we produce a map that is missing these reports, well, the voice of the map or the legitimacy of the map in that particular context is lost quite quickly. So that was another consideration for the inclusion criteria. Moving on to just give a quick thought on uh, how the search for evidence did differ slightly. I think the big point here is really that you're searching not just for one output, the one evidence map. You're searching to develop an evidence base. That means as much as you need to include and search for evidence on current policy priorities, you might want to consider there might be a change in administration, there might be a change in policy priorities. Therefore, the, broad, the search needed to become much broader to take into consideration the idea of developing an ongoing and sustainable evidence base that we need to be able to come back to if there are change in policy priorities, which then has a lot of practical implications for how you index and conduct the search, which I'm not going to go into, um, but just to flex it up. And also just to quickly flag um, that we had a really interesting experience with a snowballing search using a government mandate. So in systematic views that we produce from an academic context, we often find if we contact authors asking for additional data or studies, we don't get much back. Um, in this, in the first evidence map, we were overwhelmed. So DPME wrote an official letter asking academics to please provide evidence. And uh, we got over, I think, 3,000 uh, different citations uh, through CVs, through PDFs. Um, so we were completely overwhelmed. It was a very positive experience for us, actually. And then just uh, the second last adaptation to quickly point out on extraction and appraisal. Um, so the extraction really became not around data extraction to prepare a study for synthesis this, but to extract for policy context. So Karen did show you the, the filter functions on one of her beautiful slides. So with the filters, you can do quite a bit. You can tailor the evidence maps to different contexts. For example, in South Africa, you could see the evidence for just one particular province or just one particular um, housing policy in one particular rural or urban context. So when we looked for how to design the data extraction, we really thought about, well, what would decision makers want to tailor the evidence maps they see in front of them? for and it then became the guiding principle for the data extraction yes um i think we lost um lawrence and karen so we're i'm just trying to connect them to uh, again so please hold on five seconds uh tamara i think we might be back uh okay great and just on appraisal just really to flex the points that we did not take um, okay i heard myself talking um am i back in real time right now Great, yes. Okay, brilliant. Yeah, I'm mean, always done. Probably that was a sign that I should um, be quiet now. Um, but yeah, but just to say, we need to be flexible around visualization and use. So the second evidence map doesn't have a map to it. 
but the data sets, the developed evidence base, was immediately, there was a policy moment and it was relevant to that moment. And we then prioritized getting the evidence base on point rather than going to the beautiful visualization, which kind of sums up the idea that this is not a static product or one put research output, but really um, we're going towards developing an evidence base and knowledge management. Um, we thought a bit about, um, we thought about, about different applications, um, uh, but I think just in the interest of time, I will not go through them. But yeah, when we had a brainstorm with users of the evidence map on a validation and reflection meeting, we came up with eight different uh, functions, how it might be applied. And yeah, so then just this slide is really just to flex that there's a whole different component to the methodology around co-production and public sector governments and management of how we work together that is outside the scope of this presentation. We're very happy to talk about it um, more in the discussion. Um, also, you can email us. Um, we'll also be talking about this work in a lot of detail as the evidence uh, 2018 conference in September in Pretoria, um, and there's a body of work that the Africa Evidence uh, Network is connecting around mechanisms of evidence use more widely that this is featuring into two. So I think that's it from parents and my side, and yeah, just to say thank you very much uh, for listening to us, and it was really lovely to have the opportunity to, to present on this work together. Thank you so much, Lawrence, and thank you, Karen. Um, this was really wonderful, and you're doing a wonderful job. And um, the slides were very well explanatory. And um, so let's see, does anyone have any question or any comment? So, um, so Lawrence, let me ask you, what's the uh, hardest part uh, that you think um, uh, is when conducting an evidence map? Um, I'm just repeating the question for Karen because we have one headset so she can chip in too. So Karen, the question is what might be the most hardest or challenging part. Um, so I might just respond from a, from a research perspective. I think um, for us, kind of as methods geek, to, to let go of systematic review um, of, our, of our set approaches of how we do systematic review and to be challenged on each and every step. Uh, is this relevant? Is this going to decrease the voice or the legitimacy of the evidence map in a policy context? So that was quite challenging to me personally. Um, just you know, you've done certain research steps a million times, and you think this is it. This is how you should be doing it. And then sitting together and having to acknowledge maybe in different contexts this is not it. Um, that was personally um, quite challenging, um, but also very I think rewarding experience. I'm not sure. Do you want to add something to the challenge? Um, just from my side, I would say since we're working with sector experts and specialists, it's sometimes time can be a challenge and fitting this whole thing into their schedule, getting everybody together and agreeing on a framework can be a lengthy process. But then after that, for me, it's just an exciting process um, that I'm also still learning about. Great, great. Thank you. And uh, so now we have, a, we have a question from our participants. Which software have you used for the visualization? Okay, so that's really a, a question for our IT guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think they said something around SQL. Yeah, they use SQL. Um, but please don't ask me more about SQL because I won't be able to answer. <laughs> okay, okay, great. Um, great, so the next question we have a comment actually for uh, Michael Kelly, who joined us late, but is asking if you can speak about uh, speak to how this might be used to map evidence to develop school mental health supports. And Michael would actually love to collaborate. And is from the school social work professor is a school social work professor in Chicago, USA. I should definitely connect you guys. Um, so how this might be used to map evidence to develop school mental health supports? Um, I think the, the main thing is actually agreeing what it is that you need to, what it, what it is that you want to do with that map. What are the questions that you want to answer? What is the policy decision around it? And then agreeing to a framework. So each and every project is individual and unique in um, what's, what the purpose behind it is. So yeah, that's Basically, I don't know, Lawrence, would you like to, she's asking how would we go about in developing a framework for mental health, something in the mental health area. Yeah, Lawrence agrees with me. <laughs> great, great. And um, our next question is, what are the existing rules 
in place within the DPME to arrange contract? Okay, we have a very strict supply chain process where we have to send out calls for proposals. People send their proposals through to us. Um, we take it through a bid specs committee, bid evaluations committee. It's a whole complex process within government that we have to go through in order to appoint um, people to assist us with this. Great. So we have another question about um, we have another question about the software, uh, the tool. So is it open? Is um, if not, if there are, uh, if, are there any other open alternatives? Okay, at the moment, this map is not publicly available. It's only accessible via our internal server at the moment. That is because not all of the evidence pieces contained in there is open access. So we can't just make it available to everybody. At the moment, we're working towards um, finalizing user access restrictions. And once that's done, we'll look further into making some parts of it or maybe just the basic front end available um, to the public. That's still in discussion and working process. Great, great. So I honestly, uh, from our experience, we've contacted uh, some people who have softwares uh, that can do evidence maps, and so far we haven't found any that provide uh, free support or at least uh, when even if you contract them, it would help you um, go free with your map. I think because at this moment, uh, the maps are very valuable, but also because there's a lot of work happening with them. Um, so the more people are getting involved, there's the more changes there are. So um, yes, it would be good yeah. if anyone knows about any software that could actually help build maps for free. Um, that would be wonderful. Yeah. So our next question right. is... I agree. <laughs> great, great. So our next question is, what is the staff assigned to to conduct evidence uh, to get evidence maps? Okay, the staff assigned to evidence maps. Okay, we have a whole team that we compile that consists out of our research team. Then we have tuna researchers, we have sector specialists and experts. Then we have a method specialist. We have an information specialist. Um, information specialist that helps us with the search criteria and search strategies and searching, searching, searching. We have, we have our method specialist that's like Lawrence. Um, and then we have data capturers that will capture the data in order to visualize it in the end. Okay. Okay, great. Um, and, and Lawrence is indicating to me that he would love to say something else about this as well. Um, thanks, Karen. Yeah, I just wanted to quickly add, so this, this links back to one of the um, really, for us, exciting um, way of we work together that we couldn't quite fit into the presentation. So the, the way DPME has set up these evidence mapping teams is around the co-production and model, and there's quite a few mechanisms to kind of operationalize this big word co-production. So one of them is the matchmaking approach that relates to the staffing of teams. So it was really exciting and innovative to us that each, uh, when the teams were put together, that within DPME, each staff was matchmaked with this, its external staff from, from the uh, research audience. So the information scientist was matchmaked with um, uh, staff from DPME to learn more about systematic searching and database access, etc. I, as a methods person, was matched with the decision-making experts. Um, so it was a kind of an explicit, everybody had a counterpart to learn from each other, uh, which in our understanding is how the adaptation actually only was, was possible in the first place. Great. Thank you, Lawrence. So um, the next question is, are there plans to make it applicable to the health sector? Um, I probably have to hand that over to Karen. So yeah, the, kind of the question is, are there plans to move into the health sector in South Africa with this? Um, the health sector, okay. Um, for us in our unit, we respond to the needs inside the department. We haven't received any requests in health. I do think that that is, some, that is a possibility in the future though. Um, but elsewhere in other departments, I'm not sure. Okay. Okay, great, great. So um, our next question is, congratulations, excellent work. Here in Ministry of Health will be engagement and learn more about this experience. When are you are going to uh, develop some guidelines for help us use this exercise? So it's about whether or not there will be some guidelines to use these maps. All right, so we do have a primer. Um, that we can share um, that outlines the, 
the, the process a little bit more. And I think that there's a video as well, yes, that can be shared. Mm -hmm. Great, wonderful. And so two more questions before we close. Um, is there any guidance or other resources that we can access if we wish to develop an evidence gap map for purposes other than informing policy, i.e. for purpose of informing donors to fund research? I think I'm going to hand that one over to Lawrence and then just maybe ask you to repeat the question to him because that was Definitely. fast. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, yeah, hello. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so Lawrence, is there any guidance on, or other resources that we can access if we wish to develop an evidence gap map for purposes other than informing policy, i.e. for purpose of informing donors to fund research? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, there's, as, as I said, there's quite a few people working in this, in this space. Um, so there is, 3IE has published, for example, an extensive guidance on how to do um, uh, evidence gap maps. The International Rescue Committee has just, I think, last month um, published really good strategic guidance on their evidence mapping program as well. Uh, so that's, I think, if you talk an NGO do donor sector, those are probably the people to go to. Um, academic sectors, there's a couple of really good papers out um, an introductory paper by Michael Lee that had up also in the environmental sector there's a really good paper on, on um, by James et al on, on evidence mapping um, yeah so I think if outside the policy context there's, 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 there's quite a bit of, of guidance and I also wouldn't say that DPME is not the only governmental part I think who is experimenting with this uh, DFID does it too so I'm not sure to what extent they have written up guidance but they might and from, from our end uh, we do have uh, some internal guidance that we're currently updating and, and uh, we'll see uh, to what extent that can be made um, open access or public eventually. Great, great. Um, so, so Lawrence and Karen we have a lot of questions coming in. Is it okay if we stay for five more minutes? Yeah, yeah, I looked at Karen, she's fine, yeah, absolutely. Wonderful. I can stay for five minutes. Wonderful. So the next question is, what would be the difference between evidence gap map and evidence map? Oh, okay, Karen, I think that's for me the question is, what is the difference between evidence gap maps and evidence maps? Is it okay if I take it? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, I think, so to some extent, um, there's, there's a lot of semantics involved in these different terms. So some people prefer systematic maps, other people talk about evidence gap maps, there's also policy evidence maps, the term that uh, DFID was using at one point. Um, so to, to some extent it's semantics referring to the same thing, but um, to other extents there's, there's uh, differences. And so I would refer, if you want a lot of detail on it, in the Kakis Lee paper, she really does unpack uh, the different languages and the different methods behind evidence mapping. And Bertie Snills' paper also has an overview of different methodologies and how they differ. I think just kind of the key differences is um, around visualization. So there's a lot of mapping programs that like stay at the point where maybe you have an Excel spreadsheet of all the data and you not necessarily have a software to visualize it and you just go into writing up a report. So I think that's one big difference. Um, the second big difference is around critical appraisal. Uh, so there's maps that don't um, critically appraise evidence at all, others only appraise systematic reviews included and not the primary research, and then others do appraise um, everything. Um, so that's, I think, the second big difference. And then the third big difference is as to what is included. So there's a few mapping programs that actually only include systematic reviews in order to be able to go quicker into synthesis after the map. So if you have a rapid response service tailored to it. Um, so yeah, I think those will be the three big things from the top of my mind, visualization, appraisal, and inclusion. Great, great. Um, and so we're going to take a live question from Pierre. Um, Pierre, can you, hello? Yes, uh, thank you. I, I wanted uh, the, uh, Lawrence and Karen, uh, first, congratulations. It was very interesting. I, I, uh, you, you've been quite quick on one of the slides on the many potential use of evidence map. Uh, yes, this one uh, on visualization. Uh, so on, on that one, could you elaborate a little bit more? Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, just checking. Karen, the question is uh, elaborating on this different applications. Should I do for and you do the other thing? 
Okay, yeah, so yeah, I'm very happy to elaborate. So just the background to this um, curve diagram is we had a validation and, and feedback meeting after the first evidence map, and this was the applications that people saw for the evidence map. So the applications, this is like a thought there might be. So I'm not necessarily saying that we've observed empirical evidence on these applications. Um, so there were eight in total. Um, so on a high level, I think the what we've talked about, current has talked quite a bit about is it being a decision making tool, how it can inform policy design and implementation uh, straight away. So if you have a policy moment, a white paper, people need access to information, how the evidence map features into this. So I just maybe to flag a few of these um, that were also features is the idea what you saw on the far right on the top corner is that it's an organizational tool to raise awareness for evidence-based policy making in, in general. So that um, through the introduction of evidence maps, people are primed to think about bodies of evidence and how they relate to decision-making needs. So not necessarily saying that the output or the product itself is the only um, is the only thing we focused on, but to a wider kind of agenda change or shift in languages um, so as an organizational tool um, that was one of the users identified as well. I think the use next to the engagement tool, just quickly, was quite interesting um, in, in one of the earlier maps where there was a rather um, contested policy debate where people were referring to different evidence bases that um, they had and were not necessarily speaking to each other. So say there might have been people who had a more neoliberal approach to a certain policy area and then others with a more Canadian approach. And just by having the map and seeing each other's bodies of evidence visualized and represented on the map, um, there, there was a suggestion that that might facilitate a policy conversation between these uh, different actors from a mutual basis so that the different evidence bases were acknowledged so we could start into a conversation. Um, then, yeah, so just another one um, I'm thinking had, which just want to flag properly the one um, as an accountability tool. So there was a suggestion that evidence maps allow decision makers to make it more transparent how different policies have been arrived at and how different decisions have been made. And that then kind of increasing the legitimacy of the policy um, and going towards changing the narrative for future policy decisions, having seen how decisions could have been informed by such an uh, evidence map. So yeah, I'm not sure, Karen, do you want to add? Okay, so Karen says it's fine. I, so yeah, there's, there's eight on it. I don't think you have time to talk to all in detail, but more than happy to communicate on email or any other form afterwards. Great, great. So I think this was a very nice session. Um, we have had a lot of good feedback. We have uh, a couple comments saying that this was very useful and that um, you have greetings from Lima, Peru, from National Institute of Health, UNAGESP. So thank you so much, Karen and, uh, and uh, Lawrence. We hope that you enjoyed the session too. Any last comments? No, any last comments? Just from my side, thank you for the opportunity. It was really exciting to be able to talk about it to this audience. And thank you so much from our side as well. We really enjoyed it. And Lawrence and I were very excited to speak to you about this this afternoon. Great. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Karen. So our rec the recording of this session will be available uh, very soon, within a couple of days, on our website and, and on our YouTube channel. And if you want a copy of the slides, please don't hesitate to contact me so that I send you the copy of the slides. Thank you, everyone.